Remain standing if you're able for the hearing of God's Word as it is found in Romans chapter 10. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God is for the, is for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the culmination of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Moses writes this about the righteousness that is by the law. The person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As Scripture says, anyone who believes in Him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on Him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word about Christ. But I ask, did they not hear? Of course they did. Their voice has gone out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Again I ask, did Israel not understand? First Moses says, I will make you envious by those who are not a nation. I will make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. And Isaiah boldly says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. But concerning Israel, he says, all day long, I have held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. O oh Lord, may we not be disobedient and obstinate, but receiving of your grace by faith, that we may be who you've called for us to be. Help us, dear Lord, to continue to call out to you, for you are the only one who can save us. Amen. You may be seated. Is anybody in the congregation familiar with Garrison Keeler? Anybody know who Garrison Keeler is? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So about nine of you. So I picked a bad illustration. <laughs> Garrison Keeler, for many years he was on national public radio, uh, being broadcast from Minnesota, Minnesota Public Radio, uh, with a show called The Prairie Home Companion. And the highlight of that show, of uh, The Prairie Home Compa Companion, was news from Lake Wobegon. News from Lake Wobegon, wonderful storytelling by uh, Garrison Keeler, who was a wonderful storyteller. And the way that he always closed that, he had particular lines that he used to describe Lake Wobegon and, and get people into the story. Uh, he talked a lot about Lutherans versus Methodists and some of his storytelling. Uh, but he, uh, he, he, he said at the, at the close, you knew the story was coming to the close when he used the line, where all the women are strong, all the men are good looking, and all the children are above average. That kind of describes our church, right? All the women are strong, all the men are good looking, and all the children are above average. The reason I bring up tales from Lake Wobegon is because sometimes fiction can be a wonderful resource for getting across the truths, truths that we need to hear. Jesus himself used parables, which 
Could have, been, could have been factually true, but parables in and of themselves are stories, uh, whether they're uh, uh, nonfiction or fiction, but usually fiction. They're stories that are used to illustrate a truth that is true for all people of all time. And I say that to say that what follows in this sermon is kind of in that story line, a parable line where I've made up some characters in a situation, but it gets to the heart of what is being proclaimed in Romans chapter 10. You with me? All right. City Church was known for holding annual revival services, which by the way, our parish is asked to have one and we're going to be having a, a, a parish revival here in our church November 15th, 16th, and 17th. Hope you might be able to attend. But City Church was known for holding annual revival services, usually in the middle of the summer. Because they knew in the middle of the summer people's schedules were a little more flexible. Some had vacation time that they were use, willing to use. And unlike what we're about to do next week, the sun was often up late until the evening. And you didn't have to worry about it getting dark at 5 or 6 o'clock. Each year City Church would bring in an evangelist from outside the area who would declare the Word of God filled with the power of the Holy Spirit speaking boldly and unashamedly about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Each evangelist had their own style of how they shared the message. Some were more quiet, some were more uh, enthusiastic, um, some... Uh, they just had different ways of doing things, and they each had their own style, but they all were powerful in getting across the point of the gospel. One particular time that they were having revival, you know, when you have revival and you advertise it, sometimes you have all kinds of people show up, both those within the congregation and those outside the congregation. And among those that were at this past year's revival were Oscar, Dominic, and Misty. Each of the three had very different backgrounds in current situations, yet all of them had a common need. Let's take a look at Oscar. Oscar, like his green trash can dwelling namesake from Sesame Street, was a grouch. He was well advanced in years, and some referred to him as the church curmudgeon. Behind his back, of course, because nobody would say it to his face. Oscar had been in the church his entire life. His parents had brought him to church since he was but a week old. Oscar had heard the Bible stories time and time again. He knew them well. He'd heard them so many times. He could recite many of them from memory, word from word from the Bible. And the ones that he couldn't recite word for word, he knew the gist of the story and could share them well. But for all of his Bible knowledge, Oscar lived a very grumpy life. He was quick to point out the faults of others rather than give praises. He was very strict and regimented and left little to no room for adjustments and definitely no room for change. He had made up his mind about nearly everything by the time that he was 30 and now that he was in his 80s he wasn't about to change his mind about anything. The truth is the truth and everybody knows the truth doesn't change with the times. So once he figured out what he believed to be the truth that was just the way it is and he wasn't going to change his mind. And part of Oscar's curmudgeonly ways was a result of all the rapid changes that was happening in church and society. Change was always difficult for him. And it kept him at odds with many who were younger than him, who saw things in new and different ways. And among those who sometimes knew that though he might be a grouch, they were going to go the extra mile to try to be loving and kind to him, often like we see the creatures, uh, the, the characters do in Sesame Street with Oscar the Grouch there. But even though they try to go the extra mile, try to be kind to him and compassionate towards him, he often just wore people down on nearly any and all issues. And most people didn't want to be around him, even when they were at church. Oscar was at this particular revival because it was tradition to do so. Remember, he had been in the church since he was a child, and that church had been holding revival services for a hundred years in the community. And since his parents had brought him, and it was part of the tradition, coming to, and supporting revival services was the right thing to do because it's the way things always had been done. Right? That's the reason we do things, because it's the way it's always been done. Some of the church, however, wondered if Oscar had ever benefited from attending any of those revival services. 
because his constant cantankerous attitude suggested that he was never going to change. He was never going to soften up. He was never going to be anything other than what he was. And they were just going to have to live with it. Let's move on to Dominic. Dominic was new to town. Not only was Dominic new to town, Dominic was new to the United States. He'd come here from Central America. His English was very elementary and broken, and his Spanish accent was very thick, even as he tried to pronounce uh, these English words. Some in the church, making assumptions and asking questions and starting rumors, wondered if Dominique was actually here legally, if maybe he wasn't one of those illegal aliens that we sometimes talk about. Dominic lived in a very small rented home and the low-income section of the city, along with several members of his family, both immediate family members and extended family members. Dominic seemed friendly enough, but he had a hard time making connections in his new environment. Because not only were people su suspicious of his, of his heavy uh, Spanish accent from being from Central America, and not only were they a little suspicious of him because his skin color was a little darker, but he was also covered in tattoos. And being covered in tattoos from his neck and his arms and everywhere that they could seem to see, people feared Dominic and wondered if maybe he wasn't one of those violent gang members that they hear about coming from South America or Central America. And they were afraid of Dominic, afraid not knowing him, what he might bring to the church while being there. And if he was going to bring trouble and what may happen. They were afraid of Dominic. They assumed things about Dominic. And because of the fear that they had in themselves, they cast Dominic aside and said, what should we have to do with him? Many thought nothing. Let's move on to Misty. Now Misty's familiar with town. She'd been in town all of her life as well, and she lived her life in a mist. In a mist. For years she had remained in a perpetual high to numb herself to the trauma that she had experienced through her childhood and her teenage years. Misty was known in the community as a beggar, as a drug addict, and as a prostitute. Misty longed for love and acceptance, but she constantly looked for love in all the wrong places. She knew her life choices weren't the right choices, but she didn't know how to make any other choices. Nobody showed her a way to escape. And since those who considered themselves righteous only avoided her instead of loving her, who only denigrated her instead of finding redeeming value in her, labeled her instead of getting to know her, she didn't know where to turn. And yet on this day, she somehow found herself in church revival services. She's not sure how. She just remembers that she sat down and the mist seemed to clear. And there she was in this church. Oscar, Dominic, and Misty shared one thing in common. They were all outcasts in that group of people who were there for that revival service. They were individuals that others didn't want to be around, who were they were afraid to be around. And even some of those who regularly attended city uh, church were embarrassed by having these three in the revival services. They don't belong here. They don't fit here. What are they doing here? They shouldn't be here. And what those of this mindset did not realize was that they too shared something in common with Oscar and Dominic and Misty because everyone in that room without exception as well as everybody in this room needs Jesus. We all need Jesus. As the evangelist preached at this particular revival service he preached from this same text that I just read from in Romans chapter 9 and he particularly focused on verses 9 through 13 or excuse me Romans chapter 10 and he focused on verses 9 through 13 where it says if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. 
As Scripture says, anyone who believes in Him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on Him. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Hear that all and everyone. Last week in my message I talked about those that we sometimes want to exclude that we're uncomfortable with and think shouldn't be here. Sometimes our mind when I say stuff like that immediately goes to one group of people. But in reality there's all kinds of groups of people that make us uncomfortable in one way or another. As I've illustrated this morning. And sometimes the people that make us uncomfortable may be sitting in the pew next to us. Or in front of us or behind us or somewhere in this room. And sometimes we get it in our mind that we've got it all figured out. We're doing it all right. That we are doing all of these actions, we're doing the right things, and we get so focused on doing we forget about being. Because it is not our works and our doing that save us. It is our faith in Jesus Christ. It is His grace that saves us. It's that asking Him to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And where we have dropped the ball, I didn't have a ball this morning, I had a cleaning rag, but I should have brought a ball. If I dropped the ball, which we all do for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God, we call on Him and say, God, I've sinned. I've messed up. I've dropped the ball. And the only way I can get this ball back... The only way I can get a right relationship with you back is by calling on you and confessing my sin and asking for your forgiveness. And I need that as much as any other person needs that. Not only my best friend, but my worst enemy. Not only the person who makes me feel most comfortable, but the person who makes me feel most uncomfortable. Not only the person who is kindest to me, but the person who may be meanest to me. Everyone is able to receive the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone can be saved. All we must do is call to Him from a heart of desperation. Call on Him by faith to receive His grace and you will be saved. At this revival service, the Word of God had been preached by the evangelists who accepted the call to come and deliver the gospel by the power of the Holy Spirit. At this revival service, the Word of God had been heard as the evangelist spoke from the Scriptures about Jesus and His desire for all people to be saved. At this revival service, the Gospel has been understood as the evangelist spoke in plain and simple ways that all could understand the Holy Spirit was moving among the congregation and those who heard the message were able to understand the message that was being spoken. It wasn't that they couldn't understand it, they did. And this is what Paul covers here in verses verses 14 and following. But what was the one thing that was missing? The gospel had been preached, the gospel had been heard, the gospel had been understood, but was the one thing that was missing, and it was missing among Paul's people, the Israelites, is they didn't have faith. They didn't respond in faith. They were still relying on we're the special people of God. We're God's chosen people. We are Israel. It's good for us, too bad for you. And they had a wrong understanding of salvation. And now the one thing that they needed was faith. The one thing they needed to do was call on God by faith to change their hearts, that their hearts would be redeemed, and they would lean not on their own understanding, but on Jesus Christ who gives us all that we need. The gospel needed to be personalized, not just some story that they heard over and over again throughout their life, but a gospel that took root in their heart and became part of who they are. That Jesus would not only live on the outside, but on the inside, and the the inside would be transformed into His likeness. Each one needed to respond to the gospel that they had received, not in justifying themselves by their works, but calling on God for mercy, knowing that our works are as but filthy rags. They needed to call on God to break the hardness of their hearts, to forgive their sins, and to do for them what they could not do for themselves. Because none of us can make ourselves righteous. But Jesus Christ died on the cross that our sins could be forgiven. And when He justifies us, He declares us righteous and gives us peace. And this response of faith is required by all. Not just the Misties, not just the Dominics, 
not just the grouchy Oscars, but all of us, by me, by you, by everyone in this community, by everyone in this world. If we depend on anything else other than Jesus Christ for our salvation, we'll be lost. But if we lean into Jesus, rely on Him for everything, and be in prayer with Him daily and call out to Him by faith, calling on Him daily, not just a one-time event at an altar, but call on Him daily, an ongoing calling, saying, Jesus, I can't be what you want me to be this day without you. Come fill, fill my heart that I may be the person you've called for me to be. And in filling me with your Holy Spirit, give me peace that I may love others the way that you have loved me. When we call on Jesus and receive his grace by faith, we will be saved. The scriptures didn't say call upon ourselves to be saved. The scriptures didn't say call upon... Uh, uh, it, it, the. Let me start over again. The scriptures didn't say call upon ourselves and be saved. It says call upon the Lord and be saved. To call upon him means to depend upon him. And so I ask for you this morning in closing, who are you depending upon for your salvation? The scriptures also didn't say the just who called on the Lord will be saved. The scriptures didn't say the well-to-do who calls on the Lord will be saved. Nor did the scriptures say only the predetermined elect who calls upon the Lord will be saved. The scripture says, everyone who calls the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone, Oscar, Dominic, Misty, me, you, we must call on the name of the Lord. That was the one thing missing. And so now I say the ball is in your court. Jesus has offered you everything that is necessary for your salvation. Will you receive it by faith? Will you accept his grace and receive Jesus in your life this day that you may be transformed in his likeness and share in his goodness and take his word and his, and his love to all the world, both those you like and those you don't like, those who resemble you and those who don't resemble you in any way. What will you do? Compare yourself to others or call on Jesus? I pray that we would call on Jesus and Jesus alone for our salvation and confess with our mouths that everyone may hear the gospel, that everyone may understand the gospel, that everyone may have the opportunity by grace through faith to receive the gospel and become our brothers and sisters in Christ for those who are saved. And may we be saved as we continue to rely on Jesus for everything. Amen.